I have prepared some slides which we will have as, uh, as a backdrop. Uh, and uh, and uh, looking at this first slide, we've seen how Cape size rates have now closed to $20,000 a day uh, and recovered more or less quarter by quarter since uh, Q116. And I think uh, uh, one of the value propositions for investing in dry bulk uh, in recent period has been uh, the low fleet growth. So on the chart to the left, you see excluding any assumptions of new orders and with uh, a modest uh, level of scrapping. You see how fleet growth is uh, half a percent more or less in 1819. Uh, and you see the nominal delivery schedule uh, on DMB forecast, excluding any new orders on the on the right. So the question is, how how will this look uh, 12 months from now uh, in terms of uh, the 2019? I guess 2018, that's a given. Uh, so the question is, how will 2019 uh, look with the pickup in ordering we see now? I aim this to have a bit of an open session, so so those who feel uh, like who would like to answer could could, could shoot. Sure, I'll start. I'm in the, I'm in the <laughs> okay. First seat, so I guess in the breach, so to speak. Um, you know, clearly we've seen some ordering, which is a, an expected uh, response to an improved environment. And as you said, 18, you know, has uh, has the lowest order book we've seen you know, uh, since, since the 90s. So from that standpoint, it's not surprising. I mean, ultimately, it comes down to quantum. So, uh, you know, 100, 150 ships being ordered in a year, especially on the back of 18, when we will have, you know, very, very sh few ships, you know, is manageable. So 12 months out, it'll be interesting. I mean, there are uh, some mitigating factors this time. Uh, I'm not naive enough to think it'll stop ordering, but um, we've, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the lack of uh, traditional bank financing, which means as, as other providers come in, it's at a higher cost of capital. Um, the, the closing of a significant number of shipyards, particularly in the dry bulk uh, sector, is going to have an impact as well as many, also many of the legacy players uh, simply don't have the balance sheet. So I think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic that uh, we'll keep ordering to, to um, you know, a reasonable level, but of course it's going to increase over the next 12 months. <laughs> Robert, if I ask you a question, uh, you've, you've, you have a good, good dialogue with shipyards, I assume, so when they approach you now, when, when would be the first available slot for a reputable uh, Chinese shipyard uh, for delivery of a new build now? Um, you've been really unfortunate. We actually haven't got the faintest idea. Haven't, haven't <laughs> you, don't, you don't talk to them anymore. I haven't spoken to the shipyards for some time. In, okay. And, um, Thank you. <laughs> we have a new fleet. We bought six ships last week, but they were ships that had already been ordered by people. Um, I think that you know, right now you want ships in the water. I think that the demand side is if we wind this back a year or wind it back a quarter or wind it back two quarters or wind it back three quarters, wind it back one conference, wind it back two conferences. I think if we're honest with ourselves, all of us were way too conservative even the most bullish people in this room on the demand side in dry cargo. None of us would have expected to be sitting here today having third quarters that we haven't yet announced that are you know, going to be cash flow positive and fourth quarters that are just starting where actually depending on where your financing is or your purchase price, you've got, you've got ships in the water that are making net, net profits right now. That's wild. So, right. yeah. <laughs> We've moved very quickly. This time last year, you know, we, we ourselves were trying to do everything we could to make sure we kept zero off the table. This was the quarter that we put in bank moratoriums. That's... Net, so, net profit positive, that's, uh, no, that's, so my that's a hurdle. My, my expectation is the trend has changed. And like most things with the economists, we will have a series of recalibrating, but this time to the upside, in the sense that once the market starts going down, we play catch up to the downside. And now we're going to play catch up to the upside. <clears throat> so if, uh, okay, so no, no answer there either. So what about Hamish, on, or, or you answered uh, not my question. Uh, what, what, like 19 order book, 
Uh, how could how could that look like uh, a year from now? Is this is to me again? No. no I <laughs> or I can, we can post it to Hamish then. I, I, I assume that Nicholas Bornozis <laughs> won't invite any financiers back who finance such a thing, but um, no. <laughs> he'd probably be nice and do it. But I, I, I think that the equity is uh, not easily available. You know, ship owners have not got that much money. And uh, I think non-Chinese financial investors are going to have a hard time getting a speculative dry bulk new building program through an investment committee. Um, and I think uh, Chinese uh, investors are good for a few ships, but not that many, at least the way they're thinking now. So I'm reasonably optimistic. So expectations is that the ordering will be still kept at the low level then, I assume. Well, uh, we, we could all be surprised, and of course, the market could go as well as, as Robert uh, thinks, which would make us all happy. Um, but that's my expectation. Anyone that would like to add to this, this topic before we switch? Or? Yeah, yes, I'd like to add to that a little bit. I, I think that on the, on the private side, um, most of the private owners would like to order if they see the, if they see the freight market continue to be firm and even grow a little bit stronger. And their preference probably would be more for more Korean vessels, build vessels of Japanese over the Chinese. Uh, but I think that we're probably going to be okay even if the appetite increases at the moment because you, you cannot get the refund guarantees at the moment at these prices. So you need a stronger market, you need a stronger resale in the S&P uh, prices of firm. So you could then have the Chinese increase their prices and then get the banks to support the refund guarantees. Until that happens, I think you're still going to be at decent levels. And 2019 is not that far away. So they have to start, you know, getting orders booked. Otherwise, those slots are gone. Okay. Yeah, I, I would tell you, I, I think it's very difficult to get anything in terms of a slot until maybe the end of 2019. And if you go out and order today, you know, maybe you can order four ships and maybe you get one or two at the end of 2019. So I actually don't think there is incredible yard capacity. I don't think that's something that needs to be worried about really until 2020. Um, and I also, uh, just echoing the, you know, the possibility of getting refund guarantees, particularly in China, I still think is very difficult and, uh, and keeps, a, uh, <clears throat> keeps a lid on, on this for a while. And I think any ordering that occurs, at least from what we can see right now, will be more traditional ship owners. When you have to start worrying about uh, large-scale orders, 20, 30 ships at a time, then you need to really start paying attention. I, I'd like to so add one other part of this, and that's the, you know, we looked at a bunch of ships, as I'm sure some other people at this table have looked at ships that were modern ships in the water built after 2013, or were sitting in the yard delivering at the end of 17 or early 18. And one of the things that we were actually pretty shocked about for in the last two, three months was that a lot of those ships we looked at are really in bad condition already. Mm. And some of the ships that are in the yards left to be delivered have been, you know, their owners must have got themselves in such a mess, they, they despect the ship. I mean, it's almost like they went back to the yard and said, for God's sake, you know, we want to lower the price here. You know, can we have a no engine or can we, you know, <laughs> do, do, we, do we really have to have all the sides of the ship because we can only have photographs on one side, we'll get away with it. I mean, the, the, the actual fleet itself, and this is, this is something that's rarely sort of talked about and it's hard to quantify, but I think everybody at this table would, would agree that it's there. You know, there's another part is that you have to pay the bill for uh, all this lack of you know, maintenance, et cetera, that's gone on in the industry for a little period. Okay. So all the supply just may not be what it first appears. So it seems like, seems like the panelist is uh, then quite optimistic on both 2018 and 2019 supply then. Uh, I think at least from the, the question I often receive in meetings with investors is, uh, is this chart, and I think the low point you see here in the first quarter of 16, what this chart shows is... Uh, 
is uh, the discount a five-year-old cape uh, has relative to its new build parity line. Uh, now you're more or less on par, uh, and in Q116 you could buy a five-year-old cape at a 30% discount, and I think that was the value proposition many bought into, and since then we've seen the value of a five-year-old up around 45%. Uh, since it's low, uh, if you compare to April of 14 levels, there is still 60% upside, uh, but at the time, then also new build prices were 35% higher. So the question I'm, I would like you to, to, to help answering is, is uh, how much upside should we see on, uh, on second-hand prices? Well, if I may start with this, uh, Synergy was um, probably one of the very few companies that uh, bought ships at that time, and we took a long position that we thought uh, it's going to provide a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, the ships that we bought then have now appreciated by about 50%, so we think it was a very, very good acquisition. We also bought ships this year, so you know that has gone well as well. Um, in my personal opinion, I think um, a five-year-old ship, which now, a cape size, which is now uh, valued at around 32, 33 million, I think it has another $10 million to go up by the end of 2018, at least, in my opinion. This is a very fair, unfair graph. Mm. Unfair you know graph? Okay. Yeah, it is. It's kind of interesting, but kind of so what? <laughs> you know, okay. because... I should, we, have, we include, I should have, have included we, we 08. Don't ha we don't have capes. So in this sense, I'm pretty free, I think, to, to talk about the capes, all right? And that one thing's interesting is today you could fix a cape, at, you know, a good quality cape, maybe 18, 19, 20 a day for the next 90 days. And that's going to throw off a positive, you know, quite a positive healthy cash flow. So Gold Notion fixed days. out ships last week, they did it at the 3, 3K discount? Well, but, okay, but I'm just <laughs> saying right now you can fix it at 1.5, 1.7 million positive cash flow. At that point there that you're showing, you were fixing at minus, you know, eight hundred thousand dollars over three months. So already, that just by that, that that graph is already skewed. The right hand side, if you were doing it relative, if you were to do this relative to cash flow generation. So what you're going to have now in the industry for the first time is this cash flow generation. It really matters that a cape, you know, what are they operating? You've got capes, right? So how much you how much they cost to operate? Six, five and a half? Five and a half, six. Five and a half cash, yeah. six. It's a lot of, lot of money being thrown off right now. Yeah, I would actually argue values haven't caught up with rates in the yeah. cap market at this point, which means there's probably at least 20 to 30% of upside going forward. I think there's a lot of upside in capes. From a return on capital standpoint, very attractive right now. You're not far off in this rate structure and cash flow to the actual prices getting to a backwardated point where the front of the curve is where a ship in the water is worth more than a ship in the shipyard. Yeah. And that's what historically happens in shipping and especially in the dry cargo market. So if the yard availability is closer towards the end of 19, then we have uh, two years of, uh, of potential cash flow uh, and that will create the premium then. If you're earning 25,000 a day on a Cape, then you are generating six, seven million dollars a year in cash on a 35, whatever you said, million dollar asset. That's great. That, that cash. ship's going to 45. Yeah. 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 <laughs> are you constructive on uh, upside potential to second hand prices, uh, Hamish? Do you think Gold Notion took a bit of a too defensive move last week? Well, I mean, if you're talking about second-hand prices versus new buildings, um, I, I mean, it's, it's, to me, not, just not that interesting. If you're talking about second-hand prices as an indication of the charter market, it's more in interesting. Um, I mean, fundamentally, this is about cash flows and, you know, what is the future structure of the charter market? And, uh, you know, we're optimistic about 2018. We're somewhat optimistic about 2019, although with much less visit visibility. But I mean, frankly, 
the real upside, we think, in the charter market is 2020 when the fuel gets expensive because it has to be low sulfur fuel and the fleet slows down all of a sudden. Okay. Golden Ocean did not sell those ships in a defensive move. That I will guarantee you. It was strategic. <laughs> I would be willing to lay a bit of money that they'll probably end up being a buyer of capes. Then what are you going to be doing then? I think, I think what they did was rationalize their fleet where, you know, frankly, John Fredrickson has always believed that little ships are for wimps and real men should have big ships. <laughs> and he didn't like those little Ultramaxes because he has a bullish view to the world. So he said, okay, I'll sell those little Ultramaxes and that'll leave me some space on my balance sheet to go buy some capes. Yeah. Uh, that's it. not a yes. That, that does not, ah, that's a yes. That's exactly what he did. <laughs> Trust me. Okay. I was on the end of the phone. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would like to, to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about the demand side shortly, but uh, this topic we in DMB has uh, talked about for a while. I think the shadow capacity in the, in the market is something... Uh, that could, we argue it's 20%, some would say it's 10, some would say it's, it's smaller. Uh, uh, but on the chart to the left, we see effective utilization now in dry bulk is around 90%, uh, and that is usually a level in shipping where rates uh, move higher. Uh, but if all vessels were to run full speed, uh, utilization is about 70%. And uh, Hamish, you, you showed some calculations on marine money, uh, lots of formulas, but I, I think. Uh, for a generalist, what would be the conclusion? Well, I mean, the conclusion is that ship, I mean, our own view is that ships are typically about 95% utilized at the speed at which the fleet is traveling. If they get to be 96% utilized, the fleet speeds up. If they get to be 94% utilized, the fleet speed slows down. Um, but you know, since ships burn a lot less fuel if they go a little bit slower, um, with fuel prices high, the fleet slows down. With fuel prices low, the fleet speeds up. High fuel prices are good for dry bulk ship owners and bad for dry bulk cargo owners. But 2020 is still a bit out. What's going to happen in between now and 2020? Look, I think one of the mitigating factors to your, your thesis of... Uh the fleet speeding up and taking away 20% utilization, which I think is pretty aggressive. Going forward, we don't expect speed but, to pick but up. But I think one of, the, one of the big factors here is the fleet speeds up, port congestion goes up. Port congestion goes up, it's a big mitigator on, on the speed. We've already seen it over the last two years as we've had spikes, the speed picking up, we've seen congestion wind up. And that, then we've seen it come back off. So I think there is, um, there's an offset to this. Yeah, but the fleet can't speed up without charter rates going up. Correct. So if the fleet speeds up at constant fuel prices, that just means the charter market is higher. That's a good thing. And if I may, though, but as an operator, because we have uh, another division in our company, which take vessels in, if the rates are high, a lot of times we slow steam. And we, we go eco speed, we don't go full speed because it's cheaper to burn the fuel than to pay the higher for the extra days going slow. So I don't, I don't think it's a straight answer to this question. There's a lot of variables at play. Yeah, I agree, and it's also very dependent on sh ship design. I mean, we have a naval architect. That's all he does, he spends his time finding optimal speeds, right? And it also has to do with the market that you're sailing into, and, and, and again, ship design. So it's not one size fits all, and, and, and a lot of the fleet, which is built you know, five to 10 years ago, those ships, as the rates have improved, really don't speed up because it's just not effective. From, from a return standpoint. So there's a lot that goes into to it. It's not just that rates go up and ships will speed up. <clears throat> okay. Uh, this, this looks uh, at uh, at least our forecast of, uh, of uh, growth in dry bulk trade by commodity. Uh, and in 16, 17, it appears that uh, Arnor makes up around 70% of the growth in demand. Uh, uh, we forecast uh, Arnor to be some of the lower share in 1819. Uh, we forecast about 2% uh, Arnor demand, down from 6 this year. Uh, how should we think about the, the Arnor market uh, entering uh, 18? Well, um, first of all, the Arnor market uh, 
regardless whether we're going to see a substantial increase in the actual uh, imports of China, uh, don't forget that we're going to have the replacement effect because you have more and more cargoes coming out of Brazil. Brazil is going to have an incremental um, output of about 30 million tons in 2018 alone. Uh, so even if you know, the overall trade is flat, by having 30 million tons by three times the distance, that by itself is a huge increase for the cargo. Um, about the coal, that's, there's only one point that I want to make here, which is basically the fact that India is running on a five days coal inventories in the ports. Five days. So you can imagine what's going to happen with the coal. And uh, our company personally, you know, we've done uh, a lot of cargoes coming out of uh, uh, the US going to the Far East. So we think that's going to be a huge increase in the coal as well. We're going we're gonna to talk about coal in, a, coal in a second. I think you, John, also has some view on the ton, ton mile impact on the R&R side. Yeah, I, I, I think you're, you're light on your 2% uh, your growth next year on the R&R. Um, you've got Valet's S11D coming on, which is 40 million tons next year of long haul ton mile demand, high quality iron ore. Potentially, actually, I shouldn't say potentially, most likely Samarco coming on again next year. That's another 18 to 20 million coming out of Brazil. Um, and I know that there is some concern about necessarily growth rates on steel production in China, but what you also have to keep in mind is the world in general is recovering. Europe's steel industry is recovering. That iron ore is going to move. Um, there's no doubt in my mind from a volume standpoint. So I actually think you're probably more 4 or 5% growth rates on the iron ore side, taking taking into account the ton mile demand. Anyone like to comment on the iron ore side? Wow. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting graphs is the pricing of the different iron ores of the different related to the different ferrous contents. Hmm. And that's been very accurate in, in, let's say, predicting or anticipating the strength in the Cape demand or the Cape in the strength in the shipping demand. And if you went back and sort of looked in the rear mirror and said, well, you know, what did we miss that meant that we got $20,000 a day at the end of September that none of us really thought would happen four or five months ago, that, that spread in pricing there is an indicator of what John is saying is going to come more and more in the future. And that the market, it's weird, if you look at the headlines this last ten week, two weeks, Wall Street's made a big thing about, you know, shutdowns in steel production in China as a result of environmental reasons. And it's kind of hardly even squawked at the idea of all these iron ore mines that are going to close. It may be worth actually sort of giving a little questionnaire, kind of which is closer to a Chinese steel mill? Yeah, or if... Uh... Iron ore mine in China or Farley's production? <laughs> yeah. Something simple. <laughs> it's simple, yeah. yeah. If you look at this chart, we see that uh, the iron ore production, back to your point there, peaked about in 2011, uh, if you adjust for the FE content, uh, and it's about a third of the level of imports. Uh, uh, are we reliant upon having lower production to see import growth, uh, or, or could, uh, could the ton mile... Uh, I, I think that Chinese production fills in what the imports can't supply. You know, Chinese iron ore is less than 20% iron by weight. Brazilian iron is 60, iron ore is 68% iron by weight. Australian is about 62. They're different beasts, and the Chinese will buy just about all the Australian and Brazilian iron, iron ore that is available to be exported. They have to mine domestically to make up the gap. Uh, there was also an announcement that the Chinese government is going to revoke the licenses of about a third of the iron ore mines in China. So that by itself is going to lead the imports of iron ore as much as possible to Hemis Point. <coughs> so um, uh, if uh, so on the iron ore side, growth. Uh, 2% seems a bit too, too low, uh, but more in the region of 3, three to 5%. Is that, uh, is that the verdict? Was, uh, okay. <laughs> Should I pinpoint uh, questions now? If, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the, uh, the steel production in China then, this year it's 4%. Uh, 
and steel consumption is, is 10%. Uh, uh, so 4% steel production and 10% consumption. Uh, how, how should we think about the steel production rate going forward? I don't know, Gary, if you'd like to go. Yeah, you know, I think uh, I think it's it's a bold move to to predict that China is going to reduce its steel production or, or go flat. Right, the infrastructure spend is significant with exports down, and and given given uh, how much they intend to to build out, uh, not to mention if exports increase, you know, you could see another increase year on year. So, um, you know, oh, you know, I think it was about. 12, 15 years ago when people started saying, well, you know, China probably has another two, three years of run here. And of course, we, we know where it's gone. So, um, you know, I think uh, it's, it's always, it's almost always surprised us to the upside in terms of steel production. And I would be reluctant to, to bet against them for 2018 as well. Yeah, don't forget also that you have the One Belt, One Road initiative. That by itself is going to be absorbing hundreds of billions of dollars of investment of infrastructure from China. So why is the steel production going to slow down when you're going to have such a big demand for steel uh, to cover all the infrastructure works of that project alone? I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just going to bring this back for a second because <clears throat> we're so involved in analyzing every little single piece of demand to this story, and I think what we need to understand is the world is recovering, world GDP is recovering, iron ore is recovering, coal is reco recovering, it's going to be a great year for grains going into next year, but the true thing on this cycle is supply is going like this, deliveries are going like this. Every time this industry gets itself into recession or depression, it's supply driven. It comes out because of lower deliveries, lower supply. That's what we see for the next two and a half years. That should be the focus. It's fun to talk about steel production. <laughs> it's a little chaos theory as far as, as far as I'm concerned. With, uh, with uh, half a percent of fleet growth, you don't need much steel production growth either, I assume. No. But to John's point, and, and I think that's right, and it, it's, it's really about a recovery in, in demand against the, the lacking supply, right? In 15, we had zero demand growth the first time since the 90s, and then, and then, it, and then 1 percent in 16, and now approaching 4. I mean, we're, we're back where to historic, which is a, a slight premium to GDP. So when you look at it in, in aggregate, you know, it's also, I know the headlines and are, are about iron ore and coal, but, you know, uh, as, as a supermax, ultramax uh, player, you know, 40% uh, of dry bulk is in the minor bulks, and, and, and they all participate as well. And to John's point of, of the global economy recovering, you know, that's all in, increasing, not to mention soybeans now. Are, are, you know, in, into China have a 12% annual growth rate. So there's a lot of other stories that in total against the supply side really make up this picture we're talking about. It's also like really, it's really, really exciting to have, you know, the smaller ships at, four, you know, 14, 15 a day and the bigger ships at 20 odd a day. These are the newer ones in good positions at all. That is really, really exciting because once you get them into those numbers, the next time you, you push up, your, all your trading desks, whether they're on the customer side or the owner side, won't have, that'll just be a point they pass on the next rally up. Once you get these rates, the capes into the 20 levels and the smaller ships into the 15s, they on the next dislocation in, in, that's favorable to them, they may as well print at 40, 50 as 20. That's what happens. And you yourself know that. I mean, you, you very, very accurately forecast what would happen in the LPG market two or three years ago. I was, how, I was how, lucky back then. Well, it's all about being lucky. So, you know, <laughs> you, maybe you'll be lucky again if you change the forecast to be more optimistic this time. And, and it, it, it's, that's a big thing. If, if all of us would sit, sit here now, it's a really big turning point when you, when you take a market into those numbers? I think the average for Cape size rates this year is going to be around 13, uh, and we forecast uh, 2019 to average 20. But you say they could go to 15. I can say it can do whatever it wants to once, it, once those big steps start yeah. to change. The points above 
these numbers like 1920. These, these points where something is, is clearly profitable, we're clearly to a trading desk. We're clearly to Gary's trading desk. They feel that their ships are in demand and they're not worried about saying no to a charter on his cargo and lifting the rate one step higher. What generally happens is that in a bad market when you say no to a customer and you risk getting a higher rate. You come in the next day and there's another ship that's been cancelled, one cargo gets lost and the ship rate goes down. In a strong market, what happens if you have the courage and the ability to say no is just perhaps another cargo comes in the next day. And then that rate will go from 20 to $30,000 a day in one session. Look forward to it. Yeah. yeah. So on uh, on on shall we do some more demand or, or we skip demand or so there's no supply so why why care about demand but uh, but uh, if if new build ordering picks up you know getting, demand now you're getting it now you're getting it getting excellent yeah. excellent <laughs> so let's, let's go to how much the companies earn at what fifty thousand dollars a day for capes once again let's go now now to how much does yeah, Hamish much? earn shall at fifty thousand dollars a day. So 20, 2019, shall we do 18 already? You're 50k for 18, let's do 19. So Gary, Capes, just unofficially. There's no one listening. <laughs> now, I, I've been in dry bulk 29 years and I know enough not to put a rate out there for next year. You know, it's, and, I, and I mean that in all seriousness. Uh, Robert, Robert's right, when this market moves, it moves significantly. And whatever, whatever rate you put out there, one thing I know is it'll be wrong. Right, because, because this market moves dramatically. And it's about putting yourself in a position to benefit asymmetrically, to, to be able to you know, get through a weaker market than expected and benefit from the upside. And whether, whether you do that through your chartering strategy or, or trading or what have you. So you're not gonna get a number out of me just because I know that's not right. But, but I think what you've heard from the panel and from myself is the supply side and, and the demand side are pretty exciting here. And we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that, you know, I think uh, Nicholas started out by saying, you know, dry bulk's making all the headlines. We did two years ago as well for all the wrong reasons. So, so we should really r realize where we came from. Right? I mean, the dry bulk rates were, for a Supermax were $2,500 a day in February of 16, and today we're, we're over 10,000. So this market does move, it's dynamic. But uh, I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier, you're not gonna get a rate out of me for 19. It's hard to probably get the rate, anyone all passing on the rate, apart from Bugby, or? Well, I mean, the, the, the one thing I will say, and I won't give a rate, but um, certainly the Cape market is what I would call brittle on the upside. That is, you know, it can just crack and shoot up on the upside once the fleet is going at 14 knots, which is pretty much full speed. But today, the fleet is going quite a bit slower and it moves a little more gradually until the fleet gets to full speed. And then it can crack on the way up. So you need the full speed to be reached before you have a super cycle? Well, I don't know what a super cycle is, but you know, it, 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 when the rates jump discontinuously from, you know, to from one big number to an even bigger number, uh, generally the fleet has to be going pretty much full speed. Yeah, but you know, you know, it, 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 not, I don't think I don't think anyone has mentioned super cycle. I don't think anyone has mentioned 150,000 a day or 200,000 a day. <laughs> okay. Right. But if yeah. you want to put that out on the table, okay. <laughs> yeah, so 50, that's, that's just, that, that's, uh, yeah. But that's not a super cycle. No, that's, it, no, it's not a weight repeat, clearly. Uh, but if you look at uh, coal, we're quite uh, actually optimistic on thermal coal. Uh, it seems like uh, if you look at iron ore, you are importing 3x the level of production. Uh, but on coal, you are importing 7% of, of, uh, of consumption. Uh, or let's say below 10% of consumption. And uh, uh, China has been cutting back their coal production uh, so sharply that they had to reactivate it uh, last year as uh, alternative energy failed to deliver. Uh, is, uh, how should we think about China pollution and, and steam coal imports? Do 
go for the, 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 private, the private at the end? Sure, sure, why not? Well, right now we're having fun with the, uh, within the freight market because it's come up. And, and one of the reasons why it's come up is because coal's moving. All right, and because of the little rainfall, we've hydro our production lessened, so there's more need for the coal, and we're seeing some excitement there. So as far as going forward, I think that um, you know, with the Chinese electricity, but yeah, you know, and, and the alternative energy, rather, part of me, the alternative energy coming into play, I think we're still going to have a lot of coal being burned. We're going to have a lot of um, ships moving coal from from Australia, from Brazil, from the U.S. And I think the freight market is going to still be firm. I think it's going to take some time before you start seeing the alternative energy really dampen into it. I know we had about a two-year uh, period where all of a sudden coal was not being imported because of the pollution, et cetera. The Chinese government has an interesting balancing act to do. Right? They have to uh, deal with the pollution. They have to deal with social unrest. They have to deal with uh, market imbalances. So I think it's going to be a little bumpy road here and there with the tap where you may see the markets come off and on because the Chinese government has the ability to do that. But I think, you know, for the next couple of years, you're going to see a lot more coal going into, into China uninterrupted. Sam Artis, would you like to add something on the coal side? Or? Well, like I said before, I mean, India by itself is going to be a very strong driver uh, for coal. Um, what I mentioned before is that they're running on five days inventories. That's a historical low by itself. Um, and I think that uh, there are so many uh, coal po power production plants being built right now in Southeast Asia there, I think... 120 new plants being built with scrubbers that are going to be a really clean energy uh, power plants with coal. So I think it's going to be a, a big, big driver in uh, the Cape Says market. Um, we cannot really quantify it, but uh, I think uh, the way it develops is that there's going to be a very strong uh, player for uh, the next few years. Any topics that uh, was not, not included in the presentation that any has close to heart that would like to, to share today? You know, the, there's one topic which is in, we've been talking about for years, but it will finally come, and that's ballast water. I mean, it keeps getting pushed out, but I think by now, uh, you know, in the next, it, it'll it'll converge also with close to sulfur 2020 and overlap. And I think that these regulatory, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, these regulations are gonna are gonna have a market effect on older ships, both the, either in competitiveness and or in terms of scrapping. So. While, you know, we all talked about the order book for 19, you know, the, the number of ships that ultimately, you know, may end up being scrapped as we get closer to 2020 or after um, fall of 19 for ballast water, I think, is a meaningful part of the equation and, and, and something that needs to be, you know, taken into consideration. Yeah, and I, I would have to second what, what Gary said. And I think that probably somewhere between five and ten years from now, a uh, significant shipping company is going to need to have a compliance department just like a bank. <laughs> and uh, that the, the overhead and complexity of what that compliance department will, uh, will be doing is going to possibly lead to the same sort of consolidations we've seen in the banking business. Okay. You agree on that, Robert? Oh, you definitely need compliance. I mean, we already have, have environmental compliance in our companies. So, yeah. you know, that, that's, that's a given. The one thing that's given right now is that, you know, that, that cost is, is there. Costs for the systems are there. Um, I, I would add that at the moment, we're also in a nice place that the equity provider is not actually, to go back to where you started, the equity provider is not interested in the ordering of new fleets. Now, by and large, we have private equity exiting, and they're likely to continue to look for points of liquidity over the next you know, 12 months or so, exiting the fleets they have, rather than putting money down for speculative orders. Now, there are, you know, there are private equity companies who are there for the long term, and there will be private equity companies who will you know, probably still all the ships, but in law, in total, the capital in the market is not there to fund these speculative orders, which is generally a good thing. The second thing that I think is good is that everybody's really worried. I mean, the stocks are much lower. They're 30%, you know, Hamish's company is 30-odd percent lower today, despite the fact that rates have dramatically exceeded any of the forecasts than where his stock was in April. 
Okay. It's good. Yeah. And uh, so, so it seems like uh, to, to round off that, uh, that at least uh, new ordering is, is not that risk uh, to supply for 2019 and that regulations could save 2020 and that uh, DMB is way too conservative on <laughs> asset value upside. So, so on those concluding remarks... And, uh, and that you've, for the first time, put a super cycle potential down on the table. <laughs> oh, yeah, Thank that's, you. Uh, and you 50k? That's, uh, yeah, that's so a, we're doing whatever. that. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. And thank you for the panelists to join. Thank you.